How literal do you think the Bible is? Very literal. That's what I think too. And one of the things, you know, they teach you all kinds of stuff in Bible college that I found out you don't really need, shouldn't pay attention to. And <clears throat> I, I figured out and I have a friend, a very good friend. We've been friends. Uh, he's practically the only person that's been a lifelong friend to me since Bible college. And he is a scholar's scholar. And I knew that about him. We was in the same class together. Uh, went into Bible college the same year. And just a smart, smart, intelligent guy. And he loves the King James. And... Um, but he went on, I, I dropped out after three years, got married, moved on. But he went on, got a master's degree, went and got a doctorate, and he used it. He was, um, at one time, head of the largest Christian school uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I mean, a big Christian school, 1,000 plus students there. And, um, but anyway, as I listened to to him and some of the professors over the years, I realized that it seems like the higher you go up in the Bible education, the formal education, it seemed like to me the less you were believing what the Bible said. You were being fed all these, you got 2,000 years of historical theology that men have dreamed up over the years. And explanations for Bible verses that when I match them up against Scripture, it doesn't, doesn't qualify. And the reason why I bring this up, uh, we'll be in Revelation 3, so if you want to turn there, you can. But uh, just to sort of tantalize you a little bit on this afternoon, uh, I'm going to teach on angelology a little bit, a lot, and uh, the nature of spirits, devils and angels, what they can do, what they cannot do, and there are things that devils cannot do. There are things that, um, and interestingly, one of the things that you remember, they accused Jesus of having a devil. They accused him of by devils casting out devils. Uh, they accused him of having Beelzebub in him. And um, then somebody asked the question, can a devil open up the eyes of one who is blind? And, of course, the answer is no. And that sort of, that's the Bible's way of telling you devils don't actually open people's eyes. They darken people's eyes. They don't open people's eyes. They don't give sight to the blind as far as spiritual is concerned. But in John 6, and this, this threw me last night. Uh, I don't think I'm actually going to get to it this afternoon. But in John chapter 6, uh, let's see here, where was verse 70? The word devil in the Bible is always described to a spirit. And yet, in John 6, 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now that threw me. He didn't say one of you is devilish. Or one of you hath a devil. He didn't say that. He said one of you is a devil. And I'm just going, okay. Do I believe the... Because I know that I know that the words that God chose for this book are right words. He didn't... He didn't... Um, he didn't exaggerate... If the beast has seven heads, it's got seven heads. And, but when I looked at that verse, it, I, I wasn't expecting that. Because I know that later on, Satan himself entered into Judas. We know that. Somebody wrote me, I asked a couple people the question. Somebody wrote me and said that, well, a devil is a betrayer. A devil is this. And so uh, he was, wasn't, it sort of seemed like he wasn't literally calling him a devil. We know it's, he's talking about Judas Iscariot. So that's why I bring up the question, how literal is it when Jesus specifically called who we know to be Judas a devil? Not devil infested, not devil possessed, 
not half a devil, but he called him specifically a devil. So I'm just giving you something to think about while I think about it. I don't know that I have an answer to it yet, but it's one of those verses that just capture my attention. And I'm going, God, why did you say it exactly that way when there could have been other ways that he, he would have said it? So if anybody's got any great, profound, deep, sincere wisdom, you're more than welcome to give it out during Sunday school this morning while I flounder up here. All right. Revelation chapter three. But that's what's coming up this afternoon. Um, we'll learn a little bit about angels, what they can do, what they, how they appear. Uh, because of Genesis 18, we have two angels plus the Lord, three men showing up to talk to Abraham and Sarah. And we know then that the two men that were with the Lord were angels because they meet with Jesus uh, at, at the end of Genesis 18 and privately and say, shall we reveal to Abraham what we're, what we're going to do? And then you go right to Genesis 19 and it, then it transfers and calls them specifically angels. Two angels came to Lot in Sodom. And uh, those were very well-fed angels, I can tell you that, because they had calf and they had bread and they had milk and they had all kinds of goodies at Abraham's house. And then they walked to Sodom and first thing Lot does is invite them in to eat. It's like the episode of Andy Griffith where Andy Griffith eats four spaghetti dinners. You remember that one? Okay. See, back in the day, I could have done that. Oh, it's spaghetti. I love spaghetti. Yeah. So anyway, all right, Revelation chapter three, um, let's read down to verse three. The verse three is what I have up on the screen, but let's get our bearings straight unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Write these things hath he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I've not found thy works perfect. Uh, before God, it's not too late. Well, I look at it like this. Even if it's dead, it's not too late for God. Amen? You can be dead for years. The, bo the dry bones in Israel were far worse off than Lazarus was after four days, and yet God made them live again. So God is the... Listen, I've seen people backslide and then come back, and I mean years later... God finally br brings them back and it's just an amazing, awesome thing that God put life back into them. He didn't have to do it, but he does it by his mercy. And usually those people, usually those people that have been brought back and God has blessed them, they don't leave ever again. They say, you know, I did this. I, I lived in sin once. I came to the Lord. I backslid. It was worse than I ever was. Now I'm coming. God's let me come back again. I'm not going to try it again. I'm staying. And that's usually how God works. So and then he says in verse three, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. And he's talking about the word of God, the doctrines, the um, the, the words that have been taught to them uh, by Christ through the, the apostles. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. And again, I'm big on repentance. I think if you're going to get saved, you better repent. In fact, to me, salvation is a repentance of sins. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation that needeth not to be uh, repented of. And so he tells them to repent. And should we repent even after we're saved? Yes, absolutely. If you did it wrong, repent. And if you did it, and if you're really one of God's and God loves you, he's going to bear down on you until you do repent. Psalm 32 is, tells us that story. And it's not about someone who's lost. It's about someone who has sinned against the Lord and they can tell the Holy Ghost is not going to let up until they finally surrender and give in and say, I'm done. I got to repent of this. I got to get this out of my life and God help me to learn from this. Whip me if necessary. Take a rod after me and beat me until I learn not to do this ever again. 
And I believe God will do that. If therefore, the, he says now in verse 3 again, if therefore thou shalt not watch, because they're partly dead, if thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, what does he mean by that? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is something I love to teach. Um, I differ a little bit from some of my other brothers in the ministry and in churches in that. I think for now, the, the translation, our resurrection, the rapture, um, I do not know the day and the hour. I don't know the year. I don't know when it's going to occur. But I can walk you through the scriptures and I can show you that what may be a secret or a mystery to us now, uh, God will eventually reveal it. And he won't do it through some TV ministry. He won't do it from the guy who writes a book called 87 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1987. Who, does anybody remember that book? Remember that book? Did you buy it? Because no. <laughs> Gerald Wolf of uh, Greater Vision uh, Gospel Group, I think it came out when he was, uh, we went to see the cathedrals when Gerald Wolf was their piano player and he got up and kind of preached a little bit and he was commenting, it was in 1987 and he said he's commenting about that and he said, this guy's selling a book for $5 called 87 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1987. And he said, if he's really returning this year in 1987, what does this guy need with my $5? Right. But then he wrote a book the next year, 88 Reasons Why, I was, why Jesus Will Return in 88. And after that, I don't think he wrote no more books. At least under that name. Um, but... I, I don't think it'll be done that way. I think God will show his people and that day will not overtake them as a thief. And I, I like this. First Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But at the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Because I think, every, I think everything that we need to know is in this book. Everything. And I don't think God left anything out of this book. And I don't think that you're going to find the answers somewhere in internet land and not here. You're going to find them here if they're going to be anywhere. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety. Now I'm going to, I'm going to back up just for a second and I'm going to say something. In fact, it's going to be in the form of a question. Is Jesus a thief? Thou shalt not steal. Now, he, I believe that he is using the illustration as a thief. But number one, and, I, and like I told you, I used to read all kinds of prophecy websites years ago and one article that was real big and popular on this particular website was a guy was going into the Jewish the Jewish uh, wedding tradition and that's where you get into problems right there Jewish traditions that the Jews had a tradition that if a husband was going to marry his wife uh, he would go to her house and steal her out of her mother and daddy's house and take her away to be married. And I'm going, no, I don't believe so. Christ does not steal us. He's paid for us. We're paid for. This is a legal, this is a legal transaction that he did. He paid for it with his own blood. He paid for, he's like Hosea. Study the book of Hosea. 
And I know some things are hard to understand, but let me give you a digest of Hosea and you'll understand how wonderful a book it is. Hosea was commanded by God to go find a harlot woman by the name of Gomer. And he said, I want you to marry her. Okay. And so Hosea now, he's going to be obedient to God, but he also loves Gomer. He's not just doing it out of strict obedience. He's doing it because he sees her and he falls in love with her, even though he knows what kind of woman she is. And I want you to understand who Hosea is. Hosea, the, the Hebrew word, is, the, is linked to Yahshua, Yeshua, Jesus. Just like Joshua and Jesus, they're the same name. And Hosea basically means salvation, just the way Jesus means salvation. That's what the word means. And Hosea is a type of Christ. And I believe it was the Lord who was betrothed to Israel in the Old Testament, but had to write her a bill of divorce because of her whoredoms, and he put her away. Okay? So here is Hosea, picture of the Lord, and he falls in love with Gomer, and he marries her. And his intention is, I'm going to turn her into an honest woman. She's, she is going to, by my love, she's going to be turned into an honest woman. She won't be seeking out other men. I will give her basically everything that she wants and desires. I'll fulfill her needs. And I will be a blessing to her. She'll be my wife. I will be her husband. So on and so on. And then, all of a sudden now, Gomer puts out two children... They don't quite seem to look like Hosea. Uh, Aholabah is one of them, I think. can't remember the names. But he realizes that his plan is not working. And she's still a prostitute, a, a harlot in her nature. And eventually she's gone. And Hosea had every right to divorce her then, put her away, but he doesn't. And he tells the children, go out and see if you can find your mother. Well, they find her. And she's in the slave markets, being sold. What does Hosea do? Pays the price. Even though it's his wife and he could prove it, and whatever, but he pays the price to set her free. And once he does that and she returns unto him, now she's changed. Now she's different. Now she's going to be faithful to her husband all the days of her life. And this is what I said about some people that backslide for years. God lets them. I think God does. I think he lets them find out that it's actually worse the second time than it, than it ever was. And for him to be able to bring you back from those days and, and offer you another chance to serve him, I think it makes a difference. I think God puts a double portion of his spirit in them. It makes a difference in their life. It's like Israel now only having the Old Testament. That's God coming to them once. One of these days, they're going to understand and believe the New Testament. That is God coming to them twice the second time. That's Hosea, or yeah, Hosea buying Gomer, paying the price for her redemption so that he could keep her unto himself. And it works. The second time, it works. And she never turns away from him ever again. Okay? And so that's, that's what I see here. There are people, however, that, and this is the warning that he's giving here back in Revelation. He said, unless you watch, unless you hold these things fast, unless you repent, I will come on you as a thief. Not that I'll steal you, but I will come upon you as a thief comes. The thief never announces the coming. He just shows up and they don't know when he's going to be there. So, back in 1 Thessalonians 5... 
Verse 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. And so, and, and study uh, women who are in travail. Multiple examples of this in the Bible. Um, Phineas's wife who gave birth to Ichabod, she travailed, but then she died. Uh, Rachel who travailed with what she called Ben-Oni, but then Jacob called her Ben-Yamin, Benjamin, son of the right hand. You have all these travailing women in the Bible. You have it written in Isaiah 13 about the, uh, the destruction of Babylon coming upon them as a woman in travail with child. And they shall not escape. But ye brethren, ye brethren, there is a difference between us and them. We are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So what does that mean? I believe it means that just prior to the time of the Lord's appearing in the air, somehow, someway, God's people are going to know it. And I can give you examples of that. Did no one know when it was going to start raining? The very day. He knew the very day it was going to start raining because God yet said for yet seven days and it will begin to rain. He gave him a time frame, seven days, and then I'm going to shut the door and it's going to be over with. There's not going to be, I'm not going to open it back up. I'm not going to let people come in. There's all kinds of myths that I've read. Uh, some are a misunderstanding of how the giants showed up after the flood God destroyed the giants with the flood, but then here we have giants again. And some people theorize there's a story about Og, the king of Bashan, whose uh, bedstead was like nine cubits of, of iron. And uh, so he was about 13 and a half feet tall. That Og drove a spike into the side of the ark and was able to hold on to the ark for a year because he's a giant. He's real strong. Okay, that's a lie. It's not, it's not true. Not anything, not any part of it's true. But that's some of the stuff that people come up with. All right. But anyway, um, God clearly says that those who are in the light will know the day that it's going to happen. And Moses, Noah knew the day. Elijah. Elijah and Elisha are walking together. They're going to cross the river Jordan. They see 50 of the sons of the prophets. And the sons of the prophets say to Elisha, do you not know that your master is going to be taken from thine head this day? In other words, he's going to be taken from you today. And Elisha said, I know it. So the 50 sons of the prophets knew it was going to happen. Elisha knew it was going to happen. And Elijah knew it was going to happen. And they crossed the river Jordan. And sure enough, on the other side is a chariot of fire and a horse of fire. And Elisha is going to now get the double portion of the spirit. And so when Elijah is taken up into heaven without dying, it's a picture of the rapture, into the whirlwind, into heaven without dying, Elisha then goes with the double portion. He take, does, The mantle of Elijah was left there with Elisha. And he took the mantle and folded it together again like Elisha did. And the waters of Jordan parted once again so that he crossed over to the other side. If you count, I think someone did this for me and sent it to me. Elijah did seven miracles. Elisha did 14. That's a double portion. That's seven times two is 14. Simple math. But they all knew. Okay. Um, God told us in Amos, surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. And again, this is why I believe that everything that we need to know about what's coming in our future, God has already written down in this book for our admonition and our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come, the Bible says. Now, when I take that, and I've done this before, and I apply this to real life situations, uh, years ago, we had a couple of dear, sweet ladies who attended our church, uh, Bonnie Day and, and Sister Edna Gebhardt. 
And um, they lived in the same house. Bonnie owned the house. Uh, Sister Edna lived in an apartment down in the basement. They were good friends. And um, Edna ended up with colon cancer. She had an operation, but it didn't get all the cancer. And um, I was with her. My wife and I spent several days at their house while she was dying. We were on death watch, was what I called it, with her. And she's the one that at one point she was in and out of consciousness. And one time we were sitting there and she woke up and she said, I just saw Jesus and he's in this room right now. And um, one of the interesting things about that situation was she had to tell her daughter. Her daughter was there with her. And her daughter and her had a pretty good relationship. But she had the unfortunate, she had the unfortunate responsibility to tell her daughter on her deathbed that her daughter's grandfather was her father. That her father, her sister Edna's father committed incest with Edna and produced that child. And she did, she went all her life not knowing this. But she felt like she needed to tell her on her deathbed, and she did. But I believe that she knew. I believe that she knew when the Lord was coming. I remember James Bonds, our across-the-street neighbor, who was not a spy. Um, but he, uh, that was his name, James Bonds. And um, he worked up at, um, oh, where did he work at? Somewhere up in St. Louis. And he ends up with leukemia. And um, he's dying. The preacher goes talk to him. The preacher of this church here went to talk to him. He gave his life to the Lord before he passed away. And my mom came and told us, I'll never forget this, that as he's laying in the bed dying of leukemia, all of a sudden he wakes up and he says, do you hear that music? And they said, what? He said, isn't that pretty? That's the prettiest music I've ever heard in my life. That singing, you can't hear that. And that was angels in chorus welcoming him. And he passed not too long after that. Okay. Uh, I, I've mentioned Brother Charlie several times. That, that man, I went into that hospital room. He saw me, woke right up, knew who I was. We talked for a while and he just started praying out loud. And I started praying with him and he got done. He said, I just wanted to make sure I know where I'm going when I die. And sure enough, the hospital called me that night saying that he had passed on. And I'm going, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, Bob Fiedler came over to this church for a year and just sat and, and just took it all in. He had served his whole life serving a church. I mean, working hard at a church. And, but when he came here, he rested. And I noted that. And um, I, was, I was at the hospital the day he died. And he was going to have a cardiac cath because he was in bad shape. And we were making jokes, trying to lighten the room up a little bit. But he just stopped and said, I just want everybody to know, if anything happens to me today, I want you to know where I'll be. I'll be with Jesus in heaven. And uh, I said, well, I don't think it'll come to that. But it did. I was wrong. It did. And that man knew. That man had peace in his heart and he knew. That day did not overtake him as a thief. Didn't do it. Now, I don't know that people have the ability to really articulate it and say, I know I'm going to die today. Unless, of course, they're on death row. Okay. But I believe God's people know and they're going to know prior to when it happens. Somehow, some way, God's going to, he said, it's what he's saying here. In verse 4, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, take that phrase that I just read and look back at Revelation 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And I believe this verse, Revelation 3, 3, is tied to 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. Um, or 5, 5. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on, that means don't go to see Rodney Howard Brown. 
Don't go to a church that's got a drunken spirit that lays hands and knocks everybody down on the floor and they act like drunks and do weird stuff in there. Stay out of that church. Don't go there. Don't have anything to do with it. That is an Eve. That's Babylonian spirit is what it is. She is the one who makes people drunk in church, not God's Holy Spirit. If anything, God's Holy Spirit will sober you up. He's like a pitcher of hot coffee after you tied one on all night. Get some coffee in him. Get that alcohol out of his system. Get him to open, open his eyes and wake up. Uh, let us, verse 8, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for in helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that. If you want to call me a pre-wrath rapturist, that's what I, I guess that's what I am. But I cannot, I cannot find in Scripture that we are not appointed to any tribulation. I cannot find it in Scripture. If you study just the word tribulation or tribulations, you will find plainly that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And many other verses very similar to that the devil hates us that's evident in this world that we live in right now and if you don't believe that move to california you'll find out move to canada canada is worse now than california canada is actually dealing out persecution arrests to pastors who violate the the covid regulations by having services Kenya's, right now, Kenya's on another six-day lockdown. The pastors cannot have church services over there. Now, that just burns me up. Uh, I'm going to say this now. I'm going to say it later. When I find out that our pastors over there in Turkana and Samburu cannot have church, we have done this three times now. We have sent funds over there for the pastors that we know support our church to at least provide those pastors some means of feeding their families while they're not able to have their church services. Amen. We've done it. It costs us about, we send each pastor $100. That's a lot of money for them because some of those guys don't get, don't get paid by the church. One pastor asked me one time uh, when we were, uh, Sterling is when you were with me. And the pastor asked me the question about, the church tithes and should the minister be paid? And I said, absolutely. You do not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And I explained to him, it was the, the tithe was not for God to get rich. The tithe that was brought in by the Israelites was for the support of the Levites who were not allowed to farm. They couldn't own crops. They couldn't own goats and cattle and everything else. They couldn't own any of that stuff. They didn't have no land. And the tithes that were brought in, God, number one, gave them the portion of the tithe money, and he also as their, has their hire for doing the service of the Lord, and he also gave them a portion of the sacrifices that were brought in, and, the, and it was a good portion too. There was no need for Hophni and Phinehas to be stealing the portions that didn't belong to them from the sacrifices that people brought in. There was no need for that at all because God had provided well for the Levite priest. And whatever they had left over, then they could sell for money and buy clothes and buy things for the family and things like that. That they had that option. They could use the tithe money to purchase whatsoever they needed and so on. And it was a blessing to them. Um, where was I going with that? That was pretty good, but I forgot. I got off on the wrong track. Kenya pastors, thank you for thinking for me. Um... But since they're on another lockdown and not able to have church, um, I'm just asking God to show us whether or not we should help them once again. Um, because that's, that's their income. It's just like mine. If we didn't, we were not able to have any services whatsoever and people are not allowed to send any money in, that's my income. That's where I get paid. That's the, I don't work anywhere else. And so it would be uh, something, let's pray about it, all right? Um, anyway, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now back in Revelation 3, 
Look at verse 4. He said, Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. White represents what? Purity. Um, white robes. Um, things like that. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the heat that overcometh, the, shame, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I guess we'll look at this next Sunday, but I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And that leaves the question, does God actually blot someone's name out of the book of life? It's a question. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The greatest thing that you could ever wait and hope for in life is for Jesus to call your name out to his father. Father, this is Michael Wayne Hoggard. He's on my list. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. It'll take me the first million years to quit crying. Or maybe not. God's going to wipe all tears from my eyes. But I'll be rejoicing. I guarantee you I'll be rejoicing on that day. What a, and, not, and it's not luck. And it wasn't my works. It was the grace and the mercy of Almighty God who left my name in His book. And my question is, is your name written in God's Lamb's book of life? Because whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You don't want that. You want Jesus to confess your name. And you know how you do that? Jesus made it simple. If you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Don't be ashamed of telling people what you believe. They may ridicule you. They may laugh at you. They may mock you. They may not like you. But don't be ashamed of who you are and what you are and what you believe and what you stand for. The Muslims aren't. Bill Nye, the science guy, the atheists are not ashamed of being an atheist. We shouldn't be ashamed of saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I believe in his word. I believe every word of it and I believe it's literal. And I do not believe for a second we came from monkeys. Because as Brother Sterling always said, why are there still monkeys? Did not some of them make it? I don't know. Anyway, is your name written in the book of life, people? I hope it is. Father, bless your word. We thank you, Lord, for it. Use it for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Bless in the hearts of these people. I pray, dear God, that, Lord, that they've heard something they've never heard before. Or, God, you've reminded them of something they once knew. Stir up our memories, dear God. Our remembrances of your word. That's, what we, that's why we keep coming back to church. God is to hear it again. And to hear it again. And to hear it again. And to get that faith secured in us that we never depart from it. It is as much a part of us as the members of our body. As our very breath, our heart, our lungs, our life. Father, it's as much a part of our life as anything. And if those things are taken away, then you might as well take our life as well. Because it won't be worth living after that. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen.